Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today in the Mercury Library with Alan Weber, a progressive thinker, economic pragmatist, who filled this last primary election with wonderful ideas, a great direction, and I have to say honestly that every progressive I talked to, I talked to a lot of them, all were going to vote for him, and I'm sure all did. <laughs> Unhappily... <laughs> Unhappily, we all know what the results are. But I guess what I'd like to do is I'd love to start off to, and ask Alan to perhaps reconstruct uh, the key elements of his, of his program and agenda for New Mexico. Uh, and then I'd like us to really get into a, a pretty in-depth analysis of what happened in this election. So it's wonderful to have you with us. Well, thank you. It's good to be back. Um... Let's talk a little bit about what the campaign said, and then we can talk about what happened and why. All right, good. Um, the original premise of my campaign was that New Mexico was trapped in what I started calling an iron triangle. Poverty, low-performing schools, low-paying jobs. And that we had to break that grip in order to move New Mexico forward. And I still think that diagnosis is correct, and I still think that's what Governor Martinez doesn't get. So I would start by talking about jobs. I think when you are at the bottom of the heap yeah. in job creation, 50th in job growth, one of only two states to actually lose jobs, lose jobs in the middle of a recovery, you need to change the governor. And uh, our, uh, you and I were talking earlier about social policy, business policy, Bill Clinton many years ago said the best social policy in America is a good job. And if you really want to get New Mexico moving in the right direction, we've got to have a governor who creates jobs, helps the private sector, helps people find work. So I, I still fundamentally believe that that's a huge opportunity. I said on the campaign trail over and over again, the future of New Mexico is hiding in plain sight. We have entrepreneurial opportunities. We have solar energy and renewable energy waiting to happen. We have people all over the state ready to go to work. And some of them are doing great things that nobody talks about, whether they're social entrepreneurs really pitching in to make people's lives better, or they are actual entrepreneurs creating a for-profit business, tapping into the labs more successfully, doing tourism with creativity. There's a lot of things that we can do to kickstart this economy. We have a governor who is a prosecutor, not an entrepreneur. She doesn't get it. Once you start with good jobs, all of a sudden, you now have the opportunity to leverage that into better performance in schools. You're investing in education. You saw, what, a day or so ago, the permanent fund is at an all-time high. We've got to invest in early childhood education. That's the smartest investment we can make, and it's both for the kids' sake, and again, for the economy's sake. These things are linked. And then the minimum wage. When you think about fighting poverty, you raise the minimum wage, you begin to get parents, and often single family, uh, single head of household parents, in a position where they don't have to work two or three jobs to put food on the table. Then they can take care of their kids. Then the kids are able to go to school. Then the school program is better. It all becomes a positive feedback loop. Right now, we're trapped in a negative feedback loop. That's what my campaign was fundamentally about. So absolutely, jobs are the thing. Uh, everybody has always been looking all their lives for good work, and uh, God knows newspaper people have too. And so. But what, what, does, uh, what, what does a governor, what can a governor actually do legitimately, not, not the way she's been doing it, uh, to actually build jobs in a state? What Correct. does it take? Well, the first thing you you do is you stop doing things that don't work. You know, I, I think when you and I first met, I quoted Jim Collins, who wrote Good to Great, and he said all the CEOs he knows have to-do lists, but the smart CEOs have stopped doing lists. So, <laughs> That's great. So we need a, we need a stop <laughs> doing list of things that don't make sense. And what, what Governor Martinez has done for her three and a half years in office is try to bribe out-of-state corporations to come to New Mexico. And it doesn't work, and it's not good for New Mexico, and it's the wrong strategy. It's not even a strategy. It's a silver bullet prayer. So stop doing that, and let's look at what New Mexico has as its strengths and build on those. And what I said throughout the, the campaign was, 
don't think about the New Mexico economy. Think about the seven, eight, nine, ten economies that make up New Mexico's mm -hmm. opportunity. We have huge opportunities in energy. That's a play we're not making. We ought to be the most sustainable energy state in America. We are about number two in solar potential, 22 in realized solar jobs. That gap represents a huge opportunity. And all you need in terms of a governor is the leadership to make that happen. Another opportunity, tourism. I said all along that tourism is a great strength for New Mexico. We have not only great historical, cultural sites, we've got artists and, and cultural tourism, eco-tourism, but we're going about it in a very old school way. We put ads in the same magazines that everybody else puts ads in. So what we ought to do is shift from maps to apps. If you think about how tourists work today, they all take their smartphones out and they look at what they could do. They download an app and then they say, where's the new winery? Where's the best bed and breakfast? Where's the most interesting place to find the movie sites where films were made in New Mexico? Let's appify that. So as governor, you do what Bloomberg did as mayor of New York. You have hackathons and you invite young people to create apps and you have a thousand dollar prize for the best tourism app and kids come out of the woodwork to compete. It produces energy, creativity, and then you brag to the rest of the country, we are the most appified tourism state in America. Another opportunity has to do with the fact that while we have a lot of solar, we have very little water. That ought to be an opportunity to become the state that has the best technology Absolutely. for managing water of any state in America. Absolutely. So we ought to be attracting hydrologists and hydraulic engineers, people who know most about water conservation, water management. UNM is doing some of this. It needs support. It needs to be a center of excellence. The governor we have right now, one of her biggest boasts when she came into office was the way she kneecapped the film and entertainment industry. Yes. It was number one in America. She said, we can't have incentives for those Hollywood liberals. Kneecapped it, brought us back down to the rest of the pack. Those are great jobs for New Mexico. They build an industry that fits our people. It's not the movie stars. It's the people who build the sets, drive the trucks, cater the meals. It's a great middle income producing job opportunity. I, another opportunity that's gone way, that, that hasn't been tapped into is really coming out of the labs. We know that the labs are going to have to pivot from being about national security to being about economic opportunity. A governor can start making that happen by building bridges with the labs more effectively. Technology is the future. We ought to be the most, uh, I've said this on the campaign stump too, we ought to be the most Etsified state in America. Etsy is the maker's website has tens of thousands of people who put their homemade stuff up for sale. We are the most making state in America. We have more cultural creatives per capita than any state, uh, but we don't have the internet connectivity. So the governor can try to go sit down with Google or anybody and say, we want you to put high-speed internet all over New Mexico. Yeah. Give everybody in the state a chance to put their stuff on Etsy. We're now exporting culture to the world. Yeah. Um, farming and food production. Food today is not only jobs, food today is health. Yeah. People want to eat healthy and stay well. We've got great agriculture, great food production, but it's not branded and it's not exported. Think about Nyman meat in California. Just the name Nyman brings a premium. We've got hatch chilies, but where's the rest of our repertoire of food products that's, that's well-made, well-raised, well-produced right here in New Mexico and has really good food nutritional value? It's another opportunity. I mean, the list of economic opportunities is huge. It really is. And, and I, I left out the one that I'm most excited about, which is all the entrepreneurs we have in New Mexico who are waiting to be summoned to an entrepreneurial summit to talk about creating the new economy right here in New Mexico. One of the founders of Etsy, Jared Tarbell, never left New Mexico, even though Etsy's headquartered in Brooklyn. Hmm. They called him in Brooklyn the, the uh, wizard in the desert because <laughs> he did all the programming. He's left Etsy, 
He's bought buildings in downtown Albuquerque to start his new startup, which is a toy factory using 3D printing and small-scale uh, manufacturing. He's waiting to be recognized as an entrepreneurial asset. The governor, I don't think the governor even knows he's here in New Mexico. The guy who was the head of technology for Viacom, a little company called Viacom, he's retired and lives in Roswell waiting for somebody to tap into his relationships with creativity, entrepreneurship. Here in Albuquerque, they're trying to build Innovate Albuquerque opportunity, but it's statewide. We have entrepreneurs all over New Mexico. Yes, yes. So I look at it not as one economy, but about eight, nine, ten economies. And all you need is the vision to put those pieces together. And we ought to be doing that right now. There's no reason we should be number 50 in job growth in America. No reason. So let me ask you about another another area, um, which has to do with water planning and water conservation. Uh, this is the there is a plurality of water cultures, water needs, water districts, watersheds. All these there's a you know there, there are sixteen regional planning, and as you well know, uh, and there is supposed to be a state plan, which has now been virtually gutted. Yep. We're using ancient data. We don't talk about climate change. What what could what could a governor do to really jumpstart that thing and give our people a chance? Yeah. As opposed to blowing this this terrible. I mean, you know, we could lose it all. Um, well, a couple thoughts are triggered by that question. Number one is that when you travel around New Mexico and you have the privilege of running for governor, one of the through lines that you consistently hear is water. Yeah. Everybody talks about water, and nobody knows quite what to do about it because there is no simple answer. Uh, it's a complicated issue and for politicians, I've learned, it's one of the third rails. You don't touch it because you're only going to make people unhappy. So I think what you first need to realize is that if you're going to be the governor and you really want to do the job the right way, you should aspire to no higher job than being governor. If all you want to do is be governor, which is what I said all along, is that I don't want to run for vice president like Susana Martinez, I have no higher aspiration, then you can start touching third rails because you have no political downside. You're really there to solve problems, not to promote your own career. As a matter of fact, I was thinking about a new provision in state law which would say anybody who is governor of New Mexico is prohibited by law for running for higher, for higher office cap their career at that point and simply say, if you want to be governor, that's the highest office you can run for. I think it would actually help our state because you see what happened when Bill Richardson was governor. He took his eyes off the job and wanted to be president. Suzanne is now running around New America, costing taxpayers $16,000 a pop for her political career. That's not what we need. We are number 50 in job growth, number 50 in overall child well-being. You should have a governor who only wants to be governor. Small segue from water. What do you do about water? I think you've got to look the, the facts in the eye. We are living be outside of our water budget. We are expending water we don't have, and it's not sustainable. And so the governor has to be the person who's willing to stand up and say, first thing, take care of the water we've got. Stop wasting it, risking it. At one of the forums in the governor's race, I was the only person who talked about the Kirtland Air Force Base spill. I mean, that is looking you right in the eye. Yeah. If you don't talk about that, you're not talking about water policy. Yeah. Second thing is we've got to stop doing things that I think are wrong, like the Gila diversion, yeah. which makes no sense. It's expensive. It's the wrong direction. It's going to tap resources that ought to be left alone with the, the wrong-headed belief that it's a problem solution rather than a worsening of the problem. There are lots of ways to do a much smarter job of conserving water, as you said, getting the data on water use much more clearly outlined, calling together people who have shared interests so that we work out a strategy going forward, recognizing that it's going to be painful. We're going to be sharing pain, not sharing a surplus. But you start by taking care of what you've got and conserving it and not wasting it and then working on economic incentives and regulatory opportunities so that the water we have is used more wisely. That's the best we can do. We can map it. We can uh, chart it. We can conserve it. We could actually create technology to use it more effectively. 
but we're always going to be up against it. This is the new normal. And people ought to understand that when you are faced with the new normal, the only thing you can do is adapt. And whoever adapts first wins. This weekend, my wife and I were, were in Phoenix. And uh, I was trying to think about who in the water wars of the future and in the drought wars of the future, say, in 2050, who, who has the survivability quotient down? And it isn't Arizona. It's New Mexico and it's Albuquerque as opposed to Phoenix. 4.3 million to less than 1 million. Right. We can work it out so we can live within our carrying capacity. But let me ask you about um, this race. Um, this was a fascinating primary for a lot of us who haven't really had an opportunity to, uh, to see what I came to call kind of a Republican primary. If you remember mm -hmm. the last presidential election in which there were, what, eight yeah. uh, candidates, every one of them shooting themselves in the foot. The party didn't have any discipline to, uh, uh, to stop it. So where do, you think, where do you think the Democrats are at the moment? Are they organized enough to do something? Uh, is, there, is there sufficient leadership to move ahead? Uh, what's uh, and how do you think? How do you think the debate between the five of you impacted the consciousness of voters? Uh, before I talk about the the, the political uh, experience of the governor's race, I want to come back to what you said about water in New Mexico. One of the things that a uh, if I'd been in the general election, I would have been talking about is the New Mexico way forward. We are in a huge, huge opportunistic moment for New Mexico. And I didn't get a chance to lay that out in the primary because I was learning as I was going just how much opportunity is in front of us. But if you were to take what you just said about water and what I said about the economy, and then you add a different model for public education that we would advance under a democratic administration, and you begin to realize that what I said on the campaign trail is right, which is, New Mexico doesn't win by being cheaper than Texas or dirtier than Arizona. We win by being the best New Mexico we can be. And there is a really brilliant strategy waiting to be enacted that takes the things that make New Mexico special, whether it's history, culture, art, technology, livability, sustainability, all the things that are waiting to happen right now, and you put that together in a package that no other state can copy and we would be the model for moving forward into a new era where there is climate change, where you do have to have local economic growth in order to deal with global economic competition. You have to have education that matches the skills and background of your people, not some one-size-fits-all model coming out of Florida or Washington, D.C. And we could actually build a self-contained strategy that takes New Mexico's strengths and leverages those to the hilt, and the rest of the country would come here to learn how to do it. That's what's waiting to happen. That's the huge opportunity on the ground. I think you're totally Put that aside for a minute. The question you actually asked about was uh, the, uh, the, the Democratic primary. And uh, I think it was a very, uh, very good exercise in many ways. I think you had five different folks with different backgrounds and different experiences. I was kind of the wild card, uh, never having run for office before. Uh, and I think what you heard over time was the evolution of a clear message about what the Democratic Party going forward has to be about. We ended up, because there weren't real debates, there were, there were kind of staged forums where you had two minutes to answer the same question. Uh, which is the opposite of what you do for a living, uh, where you actually engage in thoughtful dialogue. Uh, we had two minutes to say, what's your strategy for economic development? Five of us. Not going to get a lot of depth going there. But what happened over time was we all more or less gravitated towards similar ideas around education. It has to fit the, the student, not some massive testing program. About an economic development strategy. It has to be based on small and medium-sized businesses that are here in New Mexico, growing those from the grassroots up. It's an inside-out strategy, not an outside-in strategy, based on the strengths of New Mexico historically. We all agreed, for the most part, on the, the value of solar and renewable energy and on the need for a strong uh, environmental platform to take advantage of the ecology and livability of New Mexico. So you began to see the debate 
such as it was, actually not be a debate, but an emerging consensus about a way forward. And I would like to believe that part of my job was to, to be the on the tiller of that discussion and guiding it forward through some of the ideas that I was advancing. It was a discussion that was pretty elevated compared to a lot of primaries you've seen around the country. And you had people not so much arguing about who had a worse reputation and more about what was the best policy or program for New Mexico. That, to me, gives me a lot of hope, a lot of optimism. I think if you look at the Democratic Party coming out of the primary, we have a strong Democratic team on the field. You start with Senator Udall. You look at our, our representatives who are running for re-election. You have Rocky Lara competing strong in the South. Uh, you've got uh, people, I'll, I'll put aside the governor's race because I'm too yeah. close to it, yeah. but on the rest of the ticket, whether it's Secretary of State or Auditor or Attorney General, uh, you've talked to all those people in your library. This is a very strong field of people. It is really, yeah. So you'd have to say that there's a lot of talent in the Democratic Party in New Mexico. And what it needs is, uh, you know, the ability to articulate this vision that I'm talking about in a coherent way so people can say, I really see how the Democrats have a different way forward for New Mexico. It fits us. It builds on our strengths. It takes advantage of our past and our history, but pivots toward the future. It leverages technology. It is both independent and individualistic, but also has a vision of how the community works together. This is unique in all of America. You will not find this any other state in the country. So I think it's a huge moment of opportunity and optimism. Now that said, I think we both know that Democrats are uh, uniquely neurotic as a party, and we're always worried that we're going to lose. And we could, simply because of outside money. The real big wild card in the political system right now is, and I pointed this up in my first TV commercial, is the influence of the Koch brothers and outside dollars to buy New Mexico's political future. That's happening all over America. We saw it happen in North Carolina, which used to be a very progressive state with a huge uh, footprint for economic development around innovation and the research triangle. Today, because of right-wing Republican money, it is a state that's in political freefall. So the Democrats have a reason to be nervous. But if you look at the strength of the, of the people who are on the ticket, on the ballot, really good people, good ideas, close to the ground, in touch with democratic values, I think that's something to be optimistic about. You know, there's, there's a, um, always these, these uh, strange sort of euphemisms that are floating around, coattail is a particularly important euphemism. Um, heavens knows, I think of Rocky Laura, Laura wins in the South, and uh, there's a coattail that's mighty long there. Uh, Gary King particularly has ties to, to New Mexico State in the South. Tom, I don't think, has any real competition. I don't think Michelle has any real problem either. I, I'm sure Tim will win. I'm sure Ben Ray. I'm sure Ben Ray will too, and and Maggie will. So there's there's the coattail. And it's very good, I think. Yeah. I think uh, I think the money is a terrible problem, obviously. But then there's this other thing about about the the atmosphere that the media creates in a state, and particularly a state with barely two million people. What do you think uh, the role of the media was in the primary? Who who were the good players and who messed it up? And what do you think will happen with the media in terms of of this? gubernatorial election. First of all, I should tell you that I've never met a uh, candidate who lost who thought the media treated him fairly. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to try to break that rule and be the, be the first one to say that I don't blame, I don't think you can blame the media uh, as a, you know, a, a, and put the media at fault for the outcome of the election in the gubernatorial race. Uh, I think in general, I was treated fairly by the papers. Uh, I was endorsed by uh, both the paper in Santa Fe and in Las Cruces, so I don't have any quibble there. Obviously, those are very, very bright people making uh, wise decisions. <laughs> um, I, but I think that the problem is we often ask the wrong question about the media. And, and again, you and I were chatting about this before we sat down in front of the camera. 
the question often is that you ask is was the was the treatment fair? And I I think the treatment was by and large fair. There was one episode where a TV station was fed a clip by a uh, uh, tracker who was on my case for most of the uh, primary, and the tracker edited out a part of my response in the in the clip, and the TV station played it as if it were completely good journalism. Well, that I think we're struggling right now. One of the things that's a moment of of uh, adaptive behavior by the media is learning how to deal with these stories that are fed by fake journalists who are actually trackers or phony journalists who are, have a, an axe to grind. To treat them as if they were real, real journalists, I think, is a mistake. These ground rules are still in transition. I think we're struggling to figure that piece out. So fairness, I think, is the answer, is the question we often answer. The real question that you and I were talking about earlier was the question of context. Yes. And does, does the media, whether it's television, newspapers, radio, or even social media, does it provide enough context for a race? And I think you and I would both agree that that's the place where we still don't know how to do a good job. We ask the question, was the coverage fair, rather than the question, are they even asking the right questions about the race? And I believe that if you were to have the opportunity to do what you do because of the the time and space you give yourself to work in, you would say that all of the races are so important up and down the ticket that we need to understand more completely what the issues are, what the stakes are, how we got where we are today, uh, and what some different ways out are. And how do you measure performance? So, for example, when I'm running against Susana Martinez, I come back consistently to say, how do you measure her performance as governor? It's not about do I like her or do I dislike her as a person. It's not about is she being treated fairly or unfairly. It's what's an assessment of her performance as governor. And if you look at the statistics, we're number 50 in job growth. We're number 50 in overall child well-being. What has she done to take on those problems? What is her performance? Those questions don't get asked because I think we're still laboring under the, in my opinion, illusion that journalists are supposed to be objective. <laughs> and it's a great illusion, and I, I salute journalists who, who try to hew to that line in some way, not to be all, all subjective all the time. But asking the right question doesn't make you subjective, it just makes you a context setter. So that's a big problem. The other problem is we just need more journalism in New Mexico. We need more of it. We need more options. We need more voices. We need more outlets. We need more distribution. Uh, when I go back to the point I made earlier about the lack of high-speed internet, more and more people are getting their information off the web. And yet in New Mexico, we have large parts of the state that don't have access to high-speed internet. We have big parts of the south of the state that get their TV news from El Paso. So we don't even have the voice of New Mexico and New Mexico journalism reaching all of New Mexico. I think that's a problem. I think it's a problem not only in terms of media and, and journalism and informed voting. Go back to what I was talking earlier about economic development and economic growth, job creation. We need to be in the 21st century when it comes to all of that telecommunication and media accessibility. We need to be really high speed wired up um, you know one of the funny frustrations about running for office are the number of times as a candidate you're driving through uh, New Mexico and since we're talking about politics you're you know one of the things candidates do is raise money so there I am I've got one of my campaign team driving I'm on the phone trying to raise money and I get to the point in the phone call where I'm about to say and can I get you to give me some money and I drop the call <laughs> And as a candidate, there's nothing worse than that experience. So as governor, I, pro I was promising my campaign staff I would make sure there was really good telephone communication across the state of New Mexico so we wouldn't have all those drop calls. But it's funny, but it isn't funny. No. Because how do you do business? How do you create jobs? How do you attract small and medium-sized companies to do work here, entrepreneurs to grow here, kids to learn here? 
high-speed telemedicine to function here mm -hmm. if you don't have high-speed internet and, me and, and ubiquitous communication across the state of New Mexico. So you got to build the infrastructure, and then when it comes to your question about journalism and media, we simply need more of it. We need more voices, more choices. Mm -hmm. It's been interesting to me to see that the two most uh, talked about stories about Susana Martinez's administration as governor weren't done by outlets in New Mexico. They were done by Mother Jones and by uh, the National Journal. So you have national reporters thinking we are ripe for great journalism and coming here and doing it when our own folks aren't doing it. And to me, that tells you that the stories are here. They don't all have to be indictments, by the way. Mm. They can be praiseworthy stories. Mm. They can be stories of accomplishment and achievement. I, I'm, as you know, a former journalist, and one of the best things about running for governor are the amazing personal stories of people all over New Mexico who are doing great things. And again, they're hiding in plain sight. They are making a huge difference in the lives of New Mexicans. You could do an entire journalistic take on the untold stories of New Mexico's heroes in schools, in social programs, in working with, with dream kids. They're all over the state. They're not being told. They ought to be told. So it's not just muckraking I'm talking about. I'm talking about positive journalism, too, that talks about what a great state this is and how much opportunity there is if we only highlight it. It is true that there, that there's a, uh, that, that we have, of all places, to have a technological disadvantage. It's New Mexico. I, I don't understand that. I still find that just almost appalling. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, we are doing wonderful things here. There's marvelous stuff going on. But as you just said, what are we known for in the country? What are we, what is our label? Is it positive? Is it useful? Is it productive? Or is it <laughs> terrible? Uh, and I worry about that, and I know you do too, and I know lots of us worry about it, because that label, that first impression, is, has a tremendous impact on all kinds of, all kinds of questions. The, the thing I worry about is that uh, too many New Mexicans don't think there's much to be proud of here, when in fact you and I both know there is. We have huge, huge upside potential. And the history, the culture, um, the lifestyle, uh, it's all here. It's just not something we're talking about. Um, I said on the campaign trail, you could think about the job of governor as a couple of different uh, business labels. One is to be the CEO of the state of New Mexico. And that's where I was talking about the governor's actual job performance. Who's in the cabinet? Are they doing a good job? Are they being held accountable? Uh, are they doing what people in New Mexico believe needs to be done? When you have somebody in the cabinet who says there's no poverty, there's no hunger in New Mexico, you know that person is out of touch with reality. When you have somebody in charge of education who's managed to alienate the education establishment in the state of New Mexico, they're going at their job the wrong way. When you have an economic development head who has now been uh, sued by two whistleblowers for t patting his own pocket rather than building the economy in New Mexico, something's wrong. And nobody's being held accountable by the CEO. So that's a problem. The other part of the job is to be the chief marketing officer of the state of New Mexico. And uh, I know enough from my background as an entrepreneur that marketing is a huge part of any operation. It's the stories you tell. It's the brand you build. It's the things you highlight about your state that make you special, that differentiate you from any place else in the world. And what could be easier than to do that for New Mexico? <laughs> New Mexico. Right? We have the highest quality of life of any state in America. We have the most history, the most incredible stuff on the ground to go visit. It's a tourist delight. It's a food foodies delight, right? I mean, the quality of life, the ability to, to, to enjoy the outdoors and the history of technology here, whether it's, uh, you know, the labs or the railroads or you name it, right? Mining, all of that is history waiting to be tapped and talked about. And going forward, the people who are here who have great vision and great capabilities, that's stuff to market. So we ought to be a state that is telling our story vividly to the rest of America. 
I would have to tell you that the, the emails you get when you're running for governor from people outside New Mexico are, are amusing uh, or disturbing, depending on your point of view. There was a game that uh, somebody was playing on the web some months back about if there were a dance and the different states were being invited to the dance, what would your state be invited as? And the answer is Mexico's invitation got, uh, New Mexico's invitation got lost in the mail. <laughs> That's not, I mean, it's sort of, that's, gall terrible. that's gallows humor, but, you know, you got to look this stuff in the eye and say, okay, if, you know, the old cliche, one of our states is missing, yeah. what do we do about it? And the answer is you take advantage of all these things that we know about that are amazing and remarkable facts about New Mexico. I had, uh, you meet great people. One of the people I met on the campaign trail was the recently retired uh, ethnographer, for the state of New Mexico. Uh, you probably didn't know we had an, uh, a guy who was our cultural anthropologist, but we did. Great guy, musician, who was telling me about all the things that our New Mexico was first in. The Western saddle was invented in New Mexico. Uh, we have the oldest vineyards of any state wow. in America. Uh, a certain the, the cowboy boots that I'm wearing, the style, were invented in New Mexico and popularized all over the country. According to this gentleman, we have more musical talent and history in New Mexico mm. than any state in the country, including Texas. Te Texas has its Austin uh, and its TV show around Austin's uh, music scene. If we tapped into the history of music in New Mexico, we would have so much to tell the country. You can sell it, you can tell it, you can promote it, have festivals around it, right? Art, culture, you name it. So. I think the, the, the thing right now, about you ask, if you ask the question, what is New Mexico's brand as a state, you'd have to say it's waiting to happen. Yeah. And a governor with the kind of vision that the Democratic Party has to offer coming forward could say, we have sustainability, authenticity, we have livability, that's our brand. Culture, history, quality of life. The rest of the country is becoming more and more homogenized. I, say, I said this on the campaign trail. If you fly to Chicago, you might as well be in Los Angeles. Yeah. But if you come to New Mexico, you are in New Mexico. If you're in Chaco Canyon, you're at Chaco Canyon. And it is, it's magical and mystical. It's enchanting. So that's our brand if we take it forward and we marry it with more entrepreneurship and innovation and creativity so that you take what's special about the state and history and pivot toward the future, keeping those values intact and then creating opportunity for people to have a better quality of life with more income, more jobs, better education, getting out of poverty and growing the state as a place where people want to live. We are losing our young people. And this is something else I said on the campaign trail. I, I would get up on my stump speech and say, if you remember nothing else about this uh, you know, this moment, this political moment, remember these three numbers, 50, 50, and zero. We're 50th in job growth, we're 50th in overall child well-being, and we are zero or worse when it comes to population growth because so many of our young people and our skilled workers are leaving the state because there are no jobs. That, That's people voting with their feet. I mean, if you had to measure... Governor Martinez's performance as a governor, 50, 50, and zero pretty much summarizes it. And you got to turn those things around. You do it with branding, you do it with talent, you do it with creativity. It's waiting to happen, but you have to have executive leadership to make it happen. The person in the governor's office is the CEO and the chief marketing officer for the state of New Mexico. This governor is a prosecutor, not a builder, not an innovator, not an entrepreneur. And frankly, her eyes are on her next job, not this job. You know, New Mexico has known its strength for literally decades, probably 100, 150 years. Uh, we have lived off this particular vision that you just articulated for a very, very long time. One of the great problems was is that we excluded the people who actually created the culture. Now we don't do that, um, I hope. Uh, so this is, you know, this... Uh, when I was the editor of New Mexico Magazine, we ran 
one of our 50 is missing. And it was, you know, one of the great ha-has of the whole. But it was dead true. It was dead true. Maps were drawn where you go from Texas to Arizona, and there's nothing in between. You know, that kind of thing is a is appalling to me. And there have been advertising agencies in New Mexico who have been told to create ads that have no brown in them. No dirt. Mm. <laughs> we, you know, I mean, it, oh, come on, guys. So, yes, this is an absolutely the totally the what needs to be done. It is. So, 50-50-0 uh, is a really wonderful way of looking at it. But if you were to, to give context to the Martinez administration, in an effort to highlight and to really analyze and dissect her weaknesses as a candidate, aside from her being a foul-mouthed, unpleasant person. <laughs> uh, what, uh, uh, Which I didn't just say. I, I just said that. That's good. And I, and I believe it. <laughs> but <laughs> what, 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 are, what are her weaknesses? And how do you get at them? Because she really can't hang around much longer. Well, you've hit the nub of the issue, which is we have a governor who is actually an anomaly for this state. Yeah, that's true. Because of all the things we were just talking about in terms of the democratic vision and the ticket up and down, the strength that's there, these are people who really represent the values of New Mexico. She's the outlier. She's not really what New Mexico is about. She's an invention of outside forces. There you go. And uh, with with... The Martinez name, she seems like she's local, but she's not. I think what we have to do, and what I would be doing if I were running for governor still, is simply point out where the, where the failures affect people's lives. It's not philosophy. It's not ideology. It's real life. And in real life, we have people who are out of work and who are suffering. They can't put food on the table. They can't afford clothes for their kids. They can't afford medical care. They're having to choose between paying the rent and paying for their kids' dental care. And that's because the governor can't create jobs. I think it comes back to where we started the conversation. Jobs, jobs, jobs. In the immortal words of Bill Clinton, it's the economy, stupid. The rest of the country is recovering from a very, very bad recession. We are not. We lost nearly 6,000 jobs between April 2013 and April 2014. We have 18 consecutive months, 18 consecutive months of manufacturing job loss on this governor's watch. And she's got ads saying, oh, I'm a friend of the small business person because yeah, right. I was a, a, a guard uh, in my parents' uh, private security firm and I stood outside a bingo game, so I know about small business. She knows how to be a prosecutor. That's her job training. That's what she's good at. She's a prosecutor. She knows how to find fault and find blame. She doesn't know how to grow the economy or create jobs. So if I were, if I were in the general election, and to the extent that I can help Gary King, I will make this argument as his surrogate, focus on jobs. There are none. People are not working in New Mexico. People are not finding their way forward. Our kids are leaving to find their future somewhere else. Families are being broken up because the kids can't find work. I sat down during the course of the campaign with one of the leaders of the Electrical Workers Union. I said, how are your members doing? He said, all my members are working, just not in New Mexico. They're finding jobs outside of New Mexico, no. and once they find a job outside of New Mexico, they put down roots there, and then they bring their families with them. That's why people are voting with their feet against the New Mexico economy, which is a vote on this governor's performance. She is a failure at job creation. Her one silver bullet is bribing out-of-state out corporations to move here. It is a race to the bottom strategy. You even have states now like Missouri and Kansas that are trying to negotiate truces between them because they know that bribing companies to move from Kansas to Missouri or back from Missouri to Kansas only helps the corporate entity, not the workforce. So she has no strategy. She has no vision. She has out-of-state money. That's it. What we need to do as Democrats is simply focus on her performance when it comes to jobs. There are a lot of other issues where she's equally vulnerable. There is so much anger and upset around education. Mm. The teachers are really upset. The parents are upset. Students are upset. She's taking the state in the wrong direction. She's wrong on the on every environmental issue. She is. It's not only sins of 
commission, mm. it's sins of omission. Not to tap into solar and renewable energy is to miss the biggest technological opportunity that New Mexico has staring it in its face. We have that looking at us. We're not doing it because too much of her money comes from oil and gas. I mean, these political connections between money and policy, in her case, are so clear, you trace them and you just tell it like it is. But I think the fundamental problem in any state in 2014 is if you don't have jobs, you're a failure as a governor. And she needs to be held accountable on jobs, jobs, jobs. Now that you're not going to run in the general election in Napoli, what what are you going to do? Uh, what are your plans for the future? And what are your plans for the future in New Mexico? Well, I am very, very, I'm a very lucky guy, first of all, even to have had the privilege to run for governor. I think running for governor in New Mexico is a gift. And the people of New Mexico gave me a huge gift and let me run and let me meet them. And I said uh, in the morning after, when I wrote a note uh, that we put out on our website, I said, I was in love with New Mexico when I started. I'm even more in love with New Mexico after the primary. This is such an amazing place. And the people are incredible. There is nothing but potential in this state. For all the time you and I just spent saying what the governor's doing wrong, the potential is so high. It's vast. It's incredible. It's unlimited. It is absolutely unlimited. So I am more in love with New Mexico after the primary than I was before, and not every campaign ends that way uh, when you don't win. Uh, so people should know that um, the process of running for office, while people tell you it's grueling and takes a lot out of you, I got so much out of it. Uh, I was really, really a beneficiary of the process. And uh, everybody, I said this on the campaign trail, if you believe in democracy, you should run for something. It doesn't have to be governor but run for something. The process of getting out and standing up and telling people what you believe is a gift that democracy gives us and we should all do it. So find something to run for. Uh, in my case, um, my aim is to stay deeply involved uh, and, and I am committed to the future of New Mexico. My wife and I are going to end our lives here. This is where we've come to stay. And Frances, my wife, is uh, even more in love with New Mexico, too. She's she's an introvert by nature, but on the campaign trail, she was my secret weapon because she's so empathetic and such a great listener and has such a great heart. Mm. Um, so we both came out of it better people than we went into it. Um, I have a, a somewhat whimsical notion, which I hope to do, and that is, you know, most candidates, before they run for office, they go on a listening tour. Yeah. Uh, but I want to be the first candidate to go on a listening tour after the election and get back out and travel around the state and sit down with people who were supporters of mine or not supporters of mine, but who are interested in connecting and simply go on a listening tour to see what people think should happen next and to connect the dots. Because, you know, you don't have to be governor to make a contribution to the state of New Mexico. Absolutely. There are so many people contributing through so many different means. Possibly the thing I can do is to see some of those patterns and pull them together and, and leverage them. There are a lot of great things happening already that I want to be a part of. Um, there's uh, the initiative in Las Cruces to increase the minimum wage. I want to support that. There are folks uh, talking about um, reducing the, uh, the uh, punishment for Marijuana, I came out early in the campaign and said I was for legalizing, regulating, and taxing marijuana. I think we got to stop wasting our resources, our political and, and police resources on marijuana. That's a stupid waste of time and money. Uh, there's some folks who are interested in looking at a uh, public utility for Santa Fe, city-owned electrical utility, that would change the game and maybe get us in front of conservation and uh, and solar energy in, in Santa Fe. Um, so there are all of these really fascinating pockets of innovation, social, political, and economic, entrepreneurs who are looking for people to rally to their cause. Um, I, I, it would have been fun to be in the general and, and, uh, and take on Susana and, and be a spokesman for a different future for New Mexico. I still think I can play that role without running for governor. 
So the the job of going out and going on a listening tour uh, will be fun. I'll keep in touch with people who I fell in love with in the course of the campaign, hear their ideas, see if I can help them achieve their goals, and continue to build something that's a, a movement for New Mexico. I, I said in the campaign it wasn't really a campaign, it was a movement to tap into what's the best there is about New Mexico. The response of getting the votes that I got tells me that there is a movement. It's just waiting to be coalesced. And if we get enough people together and they agree on the values and the vision, that movement can continue whether I'm running for governor or just being a good citizen for the state of New Mexico. Well, this has been an inspiration. And I mean that. And a delight. And I hope we get to talk again and uh, look at the future a little bit more. And uh, it's just been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's do it again. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.